As a business owner, you're in the washroom and you take an extra paper towel and you wipe off the counter and a coworker sees you do that. You just train somebody. So we're constantly training by our actions, our activities. And we lead as managers and dealer principals and owners. People see us, they see what we do. There's a, a saying that uh, a dealership's success is based on two items, great products and well-trained people. I'm gonna give you some elements that you can go back and teach. Because we're all trainers. Every one of us is here as a trainer. And whether you have one extra person or two people or a new hire, or if you have nine people, we are constantly doing, where do I get the material from? I need stuff, I need stuff to do. I need, what am I gonna teach them? I, I've, I've worked with these people seven years. What do I do? How, what do I train them? I mean, they, they sell cars. You need, you need curriculum. And I'm gonna teach you in the handout. I give you, I'm gonna give you some curriculum that you can go back and teach. On page two, what are my current training best practices? Now, if we had a four hours of a class right now, my best format would be do this up here on the board. Great products, well-trained people. Watch this. You want to identify your current process. What is your current in-house training process? Do you have a designated road to the sale? Do you have a designated delivery process? Do you have a designated soft TO to a manager? Introduction to F&I manager. Do you have, when somebody does a trade appraisal on a trading car, sir, what, what dealership are you at? This gentleman right here. Are you with the dealership? Uh, yes. How many salespeople do you have? Four. Four. Of those salespeople, there's always one that's better than the other three. I, I, I always guaranteed that when a customer has a trade in, the salesperson says to the customer, hey, let's go out and look at your vehicle. Tell me all the good things about your car so I can tell them to my manager. Let's go out there. And he takes the customer out with him, and they walk around and do that silent trade appraisal. And what they're doing is they're identifying conditions that impact value. We know that that's a best practice. We know it is. And the salespeople that stand out there with a the clipboard with the customer and go, um, one, two, three. Three tires match. That's good. Let me write that down. Three tires match. Now, what did they just, what was the message they just gave the customer? Does the customer have some number in mind when they come in as to the value of their trade-in? Yes or no? Yes. yes, they do. And boy, where'd they get the number from? And then what, and which condition did they pick? Come on. And then they added a gram. So they come in thinking, thinking what? I want 9,000, I want 4,000, whatever it is. And if they want 9,000, what do we tell them? Come on, what do we tell them? I want 9,000 for my car. What do we tell them? <laughs> I thought I was going to get that. <laughs> Seven or, or less. Is the, but if you have the customer, we know that that is a designated process. Do you have that process? And has it been trained? Because if your people aren't doing it, you know what it is? It's a training issue. They haven't been trained. Hey, don't yell at me for something I haven't been trained in. Everybody follow me on this? And it's our, our, as managers and dealer principals, it's our job to provide the training for them. It's a training issue. Only two things will make a dealership successful. Great products and well-trained people. It's us. We're the, we're the trainers, people in this room. And they watch what we do. Every single thing we do, they watch us. How does a good training department function? I was very fortunate having been in the dealership, worked all the positions, and then after three years of being an employee, I actually became an in-house trainer for seven dealerships, and then 14 dealerships, and then AutoNation picked me up in Southern California, and I was the trainer for 55 stores. Wow, what, what a great opportunity. I, I'm, I'm in charge of all the hiring, the placement of people. I mean, you spent 10 days with me before you even handled a customer. Can you imagine the, how prepared you'd be? So it becomes, yet how many other times do we hire somebody and say, here, hang out with Steve here. He's going to show you the ropes. And then any mistake that Steve makes is translated to the person that's the new hire. Unfortunate, but sometimes that's the only way we can do it. How, what is, how does a good training department function? And what changes can I make today? What can I take out of this, go back to my store and implement right away? You're going to hear me talk about easy wins. So you've got your single page. Everybody got the single page? It looks like this. Turn over on the back. It says what? Future it's your future action plan. So the first thing you want to do, write this down. You want to identify, identify your current process. Write that down. You want to go back and you want to document it. You want to document it, you want to write it down. Just like you should have what? Job descriptions. How many dealership positions are there in a store? 43. I know. I wrote every single job description. And if you want that from me, just email me. My email's in the bottom hole. I will email it to you. It took me three weeks to write it. I wrote it for the Penske Automotive Group. I've got 43 job descriptions. 
Leadership is example. Who is the technology leader in your dealership? Now, I want you to write the name down there of the person that is the most technical person in your store. But guess what? It's your name. Write your name. You are the most technical because you have to learn it because leadership is example. I was in a dealership and I asked everybody, okay, pull out your phones. I said, get your phones out. I'm going, to teach you, I'm going to teach you how to use videos and how to follow up with videos. This guy pulls out this phone. It was an old Okia with scotch tape holding in the, uh, the battery. I said, come on, buddy. Step up here. Get yourself a real phone. I said, you can't, you, you can't do, you can't make videos and send videos to people with that thing. This is what I get from the, the general manager goes outside and takes a picture of him. And the picture is old dog, new tricks. Now this is him out, he takes a video and sends a video. Every single cup, sold or missold, he's got his new iPhone and says, and he didn't even drop the cigarette. 40, uh, 22 years selling cars. But every single customer that he talks to, every one of them, sold or missold, gets a video. Hey, Mr. Jones, thanks for coming in today for a quick test drive. I know the car's for your wife. She wasn't with you. I'm just sending you a quick reminder. Here is the car. It is the, it is the four-wheel drive. It does have the running boards on it, sir. And I'm just going to send you this quick video. Call me in about 20 minutes. Make sure you got the video. And we'll get you and your wife back in on Saturday for a test drive in this beautiful vehicle. Thanks very much, sir. Talk to you later. Bye. Bang. Sends it to the customer. Now, you can't send it as an attachment. You send it where? You send it to YouTube because then they watch it at YouTube. If a one minute, a one minute video is 62 megabytes. It's too big. You clogged up their email. They'll never open up an email from you again. They hate you. So you have to, you have to, that's why YouTube. You use it as a place. Then you send it, write this down. Send videos, YouTube, unlisted. Write that down, unlisted. You never want to put a video on that you send to a customer public. Why? Hey, Mr. Jones, thanks for coming in with your wife, Susan. It was it wasn't his wife. And you put that on the internet, not a good idea. How many people here have trained your salespeople, trained your salespeople how to use videos as a form of follow-up? Raise your hand. Guess what? You're the first per So you're here, write this down, this homework assignment. I am sending videos. So leadership is example. You're going to go back and send a video. The same, very similar to what I have people doing now. I've got dealerships now. You know how we count ups, demos, write-ups, and deliveries? They now count videos. As the same way as you would count an up, and they measure it. If you had two ups today, you would send out two videos by the end of the day. Everybody sends a video today. Everybody's got a smartphone. Everybody's got 3G, 4G. We all have the ability to watch it. That's something that has to be trained. Now, there are some general statements or types of meetings. And you'll see on page four, the first type of meeting is what we call a general meeting. This is, a, this is to set up the training portion of the program here. This is what we call a general meeting. A general sales meeting, so write in the word general, please. This is to cover inventory and handouts, spiffs, and, and what I call pull the curtain back. Please write in, share the numbers. One of the most important meetings I have ever seen in 24 years of being in the automobile industry is South Bay BMW in Torrance, California. And every second Wednesday of every month at the Marriott in Torrance, there's a 5.30 meeting. 5.30 in the morning, every employee mandatory. Doors close, if you're not in, you're fired. Everybody knows in your job description. Simple, everybody knows. No coffee, no tables. Theater style. Looks a room very similar to this. 310 employees in one store. Now, it's the second Wednesday of every month at 5.30 in the morning. And what did the general manager show? He shows the financial statement up on the PowerPoint. Everybody in the store knows exactly whose payroll, what gets paid, and they also, see that line up there, the one in green? Bravo, congratulations. I want to thank you for that. We've brought our expenses. Every employee in that company knows if you use three pumps of soap or one pump of soap, that it contributes to that line. If you use an extra rag, it contributes to this line. They all know what profit and loss statements. Have you ever seen this, AJ? Have you ever seen anybody share the financial statement with every employee, porter? Every, the whole company knows. Peter Boson. He spent nine years as a daytime soap opera actor in, New, in, uh, in Los Angeles. The guy was in the, in the entertainment industry. He gets out, he's got a bunch of money, and he gets into the car business. He's the dealer principal part owner of South Bay BMW, 310 employees. And he shares, he shares the numbers. Did you write down share? You want to share that, you want to pull the curtain back and let people know. People don't know. You bet they are. And he's, he, he, you know what he does in the summertime? He has jazz concerts on the roof for his VIP clients that buy BMW. This guy does it right. Catered jazz concerts throughout his summer jazz series. The guy does it right. 
very profitable. Every employee knows that if a dealership is at 1.9% or 2.2 net profit, they all know that number. They don't have a clue in other stores, but they know it in that store. <sighs> South Bay BMW. Peter Boson, he's, a, he's the general manager. Call him, he knows I tell this story. I was a speaker. Yeah, look at their website. I mean, that's why you come. Give me some ideas. Now, you don't have to do it to that degree, but we have to let people know, as a general meeting, what's going on in your store. It's a good thing to let people know. So he invests in his people, and he wants them to know what's important. That's a general meeting. What's the next type of meeting? Write down motivation. That's the next type of meeting we have. You have a line there on that page. Write down a motivation meeting. Now, it's a sales motivation meeting where you might have a speaker come in or a pump-up element. So these are, I guess, types of, of training. Here's the next one up here. A Tuesday morning meeting, a training meeting, back to basics or in-house trainer. You are, you are the trainer. It's, these, when I come to do the Independent Automobile Dealers Association, the stores are small. You wear a lot of hats. Uh, I've been in stores that, you know, when I do a sales meeting, I have 90 salespeople at the Friday morning meeting. Anybody know what store that is? Longo Toyota. They sell 2,300 cars a month. Now, I've also trained stores with three people up on the Canadian border in upper New York State with only three people in it. And I asked the, the owner, I said, how many salespeople do you have? He says, I have, I have three, he was, plus him, there was four. He says, but I've been meaning to fire one of them. I said, how long have you been meaning to fire me? He goes, 16 years. <laughs> daily shift meeting. Now, this is my favorite one. Daily shift, that's the next one. Write down daily shift. 15 minutes, one appointment per day. If you measure the, measure the behavior, then you'll have a better result. And the behavior is, you have to get an appointment. Have an appointment. What can you do to get an appointment? Get on the phone, call customers, call, call your database, do your follow-up properly. We know that people do better follow-up. That's two extra car deals a month. Those are the numbers. Absolutely. We know that they get on the Facebook and do the things with the social network. That's another two. And doing that properly, that's four. You got three people, that's four times three. That's 12, that's 12 more units a month just by doing better follow-up and being more in tune with social networking that we talked about earlier today. Just those two items alone. Now, if we held them accountable every day, well, think about that. I'm in Boise, Idaho, doing a, a, a sales meeting, and it starts off at the beginning of the month like this. I'm sitting down on the side, the general manager. All right, general sales manager. How many cars are you gonna sell this month? How many cars are you gonna sell? He goes, 12. And he goes, okay, 12, right? 12, all right, puts up there. All right, good. How many cars are you gonna sell? How many cars are you gonna sell? 13. Only one better than him? Oh, come on, step up, you're better. Who's been to this meeting? Anybody been to this meeting before? This is, this is you, you, know this, you know the meeting, right? Going around the room, egging everybody on to commit to a number at the beginning of the month. And then he gets to this guy, Gary. I, I always love this. Dead center, it's like 13 people. Gary, how many cars? And Gary goes, well, sir, you hired me to sell one car a day. It's in my job description. Now, I work 23 days a month. If I was to tell you I was going to sell 13, then I would be admitting to not working for 10 days a month. So I'm going to sell 23. And the gentleman went, 23, all right, I like that, yeah, <laughs> 23, next guy, how many you got? Guy, 23, nobody else could say anything else from that point on when he went around the room, because if they said 12 or 15, they would have been, you know, everybody had to say 23, 23, 23 as he went around the room, because of what he said. I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> but it made sense. We have to hold people accountable. We have to teach them and hold them accountable, just like we do with our children. They're just bigger kids, that's all. And sometimes it's the person sitting next to you here in the meeting. There might only be two of you in your store. And that's where you both need to have that feedback as well. One appointment per day, what would that, what would that produce? Now, I'm going over some information here pretty quickly. And um, I'm sorry, your first name again. Michael and I have met before, so I'm going to do this with Michael. Inside Michael's brain, this is what it looks like inside Michael's brain. Now what these are, these are den dendrites and axions. This is inside his brain. And there's a liquid inside here. What makes memory? 
There's a liquid inside here, a very technical liquid, Michael. It's made out of uh, potassium and sodium and uh, has amino acids. For you to be able to say, I enjoy golf, to complete this sentence and to have that firing work, the, the liquid in here has to be in perfect balance. My mom was 80 years old living in Florida and she had a sodium crash. Her sodium went so low, she passed out nursing home, two months battling, couldn't, couldn't connect words. So, and all of a sudden, boom, her sodium level came back up. She was fine, back to independent living. It was weird. Now, this, this liquid in here is a very technical liquid. It's called brain juice. Brain juice, write that down. You got a place to write that down on the bottom part of the page. What is it up here on the board? Watch this. Brain juice. We got brain juice. So everybody smile. Everybody go ahead. Everybody smile. Go ahead and smile. All right, smile. Everybody smile. Think of something that makes you smile. Not that. <laughs> now, when I just said not that, look at the smile on this guy's face behind you. Look at this. Look at this. Do you know that when you smile, you release endorphins, and endorphins make good brain juice? Watch this. Good brain juice, good decisions. You always make better decisions when you're in a better mood. True or false? We know that. How important is humor selling automobiles? Come on, how important is it? If, if you can get customers, it's essential. If you can get customers to lose and laugh, that's essential. Brain juice. So we have brain juice. Now, inside of, let's see, uh, DJ. Inside of DJ's brain, there are trees. There's a forest inside his head. And on one, that, what's your name again? I'm sorry. What's your name again? I just called him. What, what's your name? DJ. His name's DJ. I know his name's DJ. I've met him before. We know each other from speaking on the circuit. Now, I know, but inside his head is, are trees. And on one of the trees is the information of his name, DJ, on the forest. See, everything you've ever seen, tasted, smelled, and experienced is stored and saved in your brain forever. First name? Mike. Mike stopped at a red light nine years ago. Casually read the license plate number of the vehicle in front of him. That information is still inside your head. You just don't have paths to it. But in his brain, that tree, here's his name. AJ. And he's gone back to that tree so often, he's created a path in the dirt in the forest. And that's what makes memory. Is by going back to a piece of information over and over. Hey, little boy, what's your name? My name. My, what's your name? My name's Mike. My name's Mike. Mike. You've gone back so often. You have that on a tree. And that's what training does. It creates a path in the brain. The repetition is what makes memory. And that's why a daily meeting constantly reminds people that when you do a trade appraisal, you should take the customer with you. When you do your follow-up, you should do it this way. When you do an assessment of, of whatever portion of the road to the sale, you should do a complete uh, walk around when you do a presentation on a vehicle, not shortcut it, just say, here are the keys, go for a test drive. And so we know if we keep on doing that, we create paths in the dirt, and that's what makes memory. Do you know how they make universities and colleges? They built all the buildings, and they wait for the third semester to see where the students cut across the lawn, and then they put the paths in. I think that's brilliant. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? They want to wait to see where the paths are going to be, and then they put the real paths in. So what do we do by daily training? When we have a daily, what do we create? We're creating paths in the dirt. That's what makes memory. It's the repetition of things. And to make sure that if there's anything new, as things change, which they change all the time, we, met, we mentioned it this morning, social network is changing. So we as trainers have to address this. Now, what's it? Paths in the what? Come on, paths in the what? Dirt. Paths in the dirt, exactly. That's what it is. It's paths in the dirt. It's what makes memory. And that's what it is up there on the board. Impact, duration equals daily training. Brain juice, paths in the dirt. So if you haven't already written down, please on your homework page, flip it over, write down, daily training. And you say, oh my gosh, I'm so small. There's only two, three people. No, 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 no. 15 minutes. You don't come off the bench and shoot the winning foul shot. You don't come off the bench and hit the, the puck in the net. You have to practice. Write down nctd.com. nctd.com. It stands for newcartestdrive.com. You go up to the left-hand side, you click on automobiles, you come down, let's say you've got a Chevrolet, it's a 2009. You click on the 2009 Chevrolet, Chevrolet Silverado and it gives you a complete uh, summary uh, spec sheet brochure on that particular vehicle. You take it, you make a photocopy of it, you put it in a packet and you put it in the car. When the salesperson goes and sells the car, they pull out the packet, they've got the specs, they know the towing, they know everything on the vehicle. That's what it's for, used. It's all pre-owned. NC. NCTD.com. What's the goes back to? 2001. 
free. That's why you come to conventions to get this stuff. It stands for new car test drive. But you have all of what? All of your past, and you want to go to the summary sheet, and you take the summary sheet, and you take the summary paragraph, and you cut and paste, and you put it on your vehicle description on the internet. You don't have to rewrite it yourself. That's worth coming here for. Simple? Easy. Give me some ideas. Give me some ideas. That's what I come here for. NCTD.com. Write this down. Value folders in vehicles. You want to put a value folder in every car. What's your oldest vehicle right now in your inventory, sir? I can't remember, really. Anybody who can tell me what's your oldest, oldest vehicle in inventory? 79 Cadillac. What, 97? 79 Cadillac. 79 Cadillac. We're not going there. I'm going to go somewhere. I can't. I can't handle that one. You got me. You got me. What do you got? Audi S5. Yeah. What? Audi S5. Audi S5? 2010, bang, NCTD, you can see the specs, you can see the horsepower, you can see the engine size, the displacement, all of it. You take that sheet and the first page, if you don't like the first paragraph, cut the second paragraph out, put that on the description. So you don't have to sit there and try to write one out. I'm driving down the car, this car is like a dream. And when you go around corners, it sticks to the road like Velcro. Yeah. That's the stuff that people want. Yeah. You want it? No, I don't want it. <laughs> nice job though, I like that. I want you to think about training. Selling cars on Tuesdays is the name of this program, but it means that there is no low day. There's no big day or low. If I was to have a daily shift meeting every day to get people what? Like that movie set, get them up and rolling. Now the six biggest mistakes are on the next page. So on page six it says, training mistakes. Number one, teaching too much theory, not enough role play. Not focusing on the techniques proven by other top professionals in our industry, best practices. Not measure, or mistaking product training for sales training. That's not sales training, that's product training. Measuring the result and hold trainers accountable. I am held accountable. When I did work for Mercedes-Benz in 2008, 2009 for 353 Mercedes-Benz stores, it was a very big contract for me to do that. We started off with 12 major cities. I had to move the needle. If I didn't, I had to give them a refund. I have big contracts. I give 100% guarantee. 100, I've done over 2,000 seminars with 41,000 students in 24 years. I've given money back three times. That's not bad. No, not perfect, but that's not bad. I have a full refund. I have to be held accountable. Have to be. Your trainer should be held accountable. Engage your sales managers. How many times do I do training? Everybody knows this as a trainer. You go in and you're in a sales meeting and where's the, where's the manager? Where's the Because man when I leave, I need the manager to what? Keep the material going. Just like you're the, mater you're the managers now, you have to keep the material going. And you need to have curriculum, something that you can do on a regular basis. So here's how you change it to the best, from the negative to the positive, at the bottom of page six. And it would be what? It would be increased role play. So now on the page seven, here's how I get some material to stick. Would you please write on page seven, number one, roll. Write the word in there, roll, on page seven. Get your pens out. Thank you. Anybody else need a handout? We're on page seven. Number two, best practices. What's the NIADA has put together what? Dealer 20 groups. Dealer 20 groups are where owners and dealer principals can share best practices. It's a great resource for you. My background's professional sports. I was a downhill ski racer for the United States. Uh, I was uh, amateur for four years, professional for four years. So eight years of running gates. Then I became a ski instructor, an examiner, and a division clinic leader. So my job was to go around to the ski schools of the United States and certify the directors of a curriculum for their curriculum development for teaching children and adults snowboard and skiing. That was my job. It's your foot. This is the metatarsal phalanges articulation. And because it's on the front part of the foot, on the inside of the foot, when you press on that part, your ski will turn immediately. You will not find this in ski schools. They will not teach this to you. Why? Because you won't come back for another lesson because you learn too fast. I know. They won't allow this in the books that I write. Street smart. In skiing, you want to stay perpendicular to the slope. Because it keeps the weight on the front part of the foot. What happens when the slope tilts? Where do I need to be? Come on, where do I need to be? Forward. Forward. I need to be way out here with my upper body. I need to be way out here. You're walking down a stairway and you're carrying a big box. And you're walking down a stairway carrying a box. And you start to feel a little bit out of balance. Where would you lean for safety? 
That's natural. There's nothing natural about skiing. It's a learned sport. To lean down the hill, all your internal gyroscopes go, no, 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 that's not natural. But that's where the control comes from. As I have you go back and do things different, you're going to feel out of balance. I have to get you out of your comfort zone. I've got to get you to feel uncomfortable. So, number three, sales training. Did you write down sales? Number four, write down measure the results. Number five, write down engage your managers. Number six, write down follow up. I've done presentations in training rooms where I'm showing my LCD projector on the refrigerator in the break room. All right, that might be the case in some of the stores that you represent here. But you need to have some type of a training area that's designated for training in your store. How many people have that now? Raise your hand. Excellent. Not enough people are raising their hands though. You need to have something, if it's a break room, then just make sure that it is a training break room. In other words, if you have a road to the sale, what should you do? You should take the road to the sale, go to FedEx office, have it printed on a laminated poster and put it on the wall in your break room so that everybody has lunch sees what? Oh yeah, I've got to do, they, they, it's called peripheral learning. Turn your break room or your training room into a place that has the subconscious message that's constantly being taught to your, to your staff members. Everybody get that? It's very, very important to have it. Sure, you have pictures of cars. You've got other things. Maybe your uh, required uh, um, uh, HR things are in there for, for uh, hourly rate or whatever those things. I, I know what you, but you should also make it a training room. Put, it's called peripheral learning. So anything that you can put on the walls there, they're going to constantly see it affects where all learning takes place in the subconscious mind, not the conscious mind. This is where, this is where you're listening to me right here. Everybody look at this right here. This is where you're listening to me right here. This is, the, this is your desktop. This down here, the rest of the triangle all below here, this is the hard drive. This is your subconscious mind. That's when you were coming in here going, who's this guy up front? I don't know if I like this. Is my chair comfortable? Is it not comfortable? Is the room too cold? To That's the subconscious mind constantly in the background doing all that chatter that really does direct your activities. So I would like to teach to the subconscious mind. That's where all learning takes place. So put up things around you. Get an LCD projector or a laptop that you can present and become a trainer. Make it comfortable for people. Peripheral learning, road to the sale, poster size on the wall. That's another note to put down. Write that down on your, on your takeaway sheet for today. The seven keys to success. How can you be burned out when you've never been on fire? <laughs> Would you please, on the top part of that page, it says the word passion. Would you please write in three words, job, career, and lifestyle. Job, career, and lifestyle. The people in this room, the automobile industry is a lifestyle. You have some people work in your dealership, it's just a job. Am I right, sir? Yeah, it's just a job to them. Then you have other people go, oh, it's my career. And then you have other people go, it's my lifestyle. But the people that are passionate about what they do absolutely love the industry. We hire our problems. As managers, we hire our problems. I was responsible for staffing seven dealerships at one point, and I had a, a, a stack of, of Applications that were in the reject pile with post-its on it. No, no experience. Too many dealerships worked around. No, no. And I found this one where it had no, no experience, but I looked at it and they missed something on the bottom. Eagle Scout. Now, I looked at, the guy wrote down the year that he graduated high school. It was the year that we were in, because you can't really tell what a person's age is, right? But I, well, he's going to be 19 years old at the most. And I asked the manager who interviewed him, I said, why is this guy in the reject? No experience, been a carpenter, not, not right for the car business. I said, but did you see this thing at the bottom here? Eagle Scout? What is an Eagle Scout? Anybody, what, what's an Eagle Scout? Somebody knows that, know how to work hard and achieve things. Everybody follow me on this? I want to see this guy. So I called him on the phone. He came in. He had no tie. He had slacks on, but he was dressed nice, you know, but no tie. And after about 10 minutes, I went, something about this guy. I didn't know what, come on with me. We walk outside and it says Pacific Coast Highway, Torrance, California, northbound, southbound. I'm in a Ford store. What's next door? Mercedes Benz, Lexus, Toyota. It's Car Row. And this is a main thoroughfare northbound, about 16 miles south of LAX airport. High concentration of people. I take this guy outside, I said to him, go ahead, start naming cars. Jeep Grand Cherokee, Mercedes Benz, F-150, that's a Ford Ram truck. This guy was na nailing it, nailing them. I'm going, how do you do it? Oh, I've been reading Car and Driver magazine since I was 10 years old. Bang, I hired him. Passion. The guy, I can't teach passion. I'll hire it every day. I can teach people how to sell things. You can teach people how to sell. You hire personalities and you hire passion. 
Three years on the line selling cars. The guy walked 19, 20, 21, 22. At 22 years old in the Ford store, ends up in F&I. Another three years in F&I, ends up back a desk manager. And by the time he was 29, director of finance for a Ford store in Southern California. His name is Eric Witt. You can call him. He's there today. He's in my book. You guys all get a copy of my book. If you'd like to, I'll send you a copy of my book. No charge. Don't pay for Don't go on and buy it. I, like, I, I want people to learn things. You ever heard the title of my book, the number one best-selling book? You haven't heard it? That's the title, the number one best-selling book. <laughs> Can you believe no one's ever had that title? The number one best-selling book by Paul Webb. My sister can now say my brother's the author of the number one best-selling book. <laughs> That's about 83 pages, industry-specific, automotive. And the Eric Witt story is in there. Passion. You have to have an excitement for it. And people pick up on that from us. So if you're going, oh, okay, we got a sales meeting this morning, and or, that's not passionate. Everybody follow me on that? You've, you've got to have, they see it from you. You're the example. Leadership is example. You have to have belief in your company, your product and service. Enthusiasm is fickle. Belief is long term. I got that the other day. I like that. I really like that. Enthusiasm is fickle. It comes and goes. But belief is long term. And having a belief. How important is positive self-esteem? I'll go back to screen. Belief in yourself. How important is positive self-esteem? How important is that? 100%. If you get up in the morning, I mean, it, and you get up, rah, 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 right? This is how you come into work. Rah, rah, rah. Will, will co-workers pick up on that? Will customers pick up on that? Yes or no? Yes. So you have to have a strong self-esteem. A, a pride in who you are. A belief in Now, if you wake up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror and go, mm, then we got a problem. That's, go that's called being in love with yourself. <laughs> okay? But do people say no to you in this business? Yes or no? Do they say no to you? Yes. yes. And if you get too, no, no, you get too many no's, a person with low self-esteem goes home, goes to bed for three days. But a person with a high self no, your loss, next. Are we following me on this? You have to have that in this business. And it comes from you. You're the example of these things. You're the leader in these things. This is all part of training. What can you take from me right now? From my, I have been doing stand-up for 24 years. I have been doing these dialogues up here in front of you. I'm videotaped every three, four months. I go to training myself. I personally work with a Harvard Business School to get more education on leadership and management skills so they can come back with fresh material. Dr. Jeanette Voss is my personal counselor. She's in New Zealand. She teaches me. She wrote the book called The Learning Revolution, 650 pages. And you can read it in 30 minutes. Why? Because the left-hand page is is a summary of what's on the right. If you read the whole book, just the left page, you can read the whole book in 30 minutes. She's brilliant. So I work with people that have masters in education. Me, my background, ski instructor and a lifeguard. But I'm always learning. I want to learn. I want to learn from the audience. I want to know what people, what are some of your best practices? I'm always learning. And that's you. If you're always learning, if you're the technical person, the best technology person in your store, you send a message to people. It's not that you delegate. You have to, you can't do it all. But there, you have to delegate the training then to somebody and have them be that person that has the belief, the passion, up here on the board. I'm going to skip through these items, but this one I will keep. How do you answer the phone? Bring, bring. This is our last topic here because we're, we're, we moved really quickly. Bring, bring. How do you answer the phone? Let's go right here. We're calling her from Monomar. This is Mike. How may I be of service? How may I help you? Next, how do you answer the question? How may I be of service to you? Answer that. Bring, bring. How do you answer the phone, store? That's okay. Next. <laughs> I'll come back to you. I'll phone. come back to you. You never answer the phone. That's, some of you don't. Do you ever answer the phone in your store? Yeah. Oh, I'll start there. Let's see. Simple. I, I just say, hi, Country Motors. This is David. This is David. Perfect. How do you answer the phone in your store, sir? How Motors. This is Vince. This is, how can I help you? How, now, watch this. I'm going to give you a whole semester of applied psychology in two sentences. Watch this. The brain takes words literally, and human beings can only act on the information they are given. You say to a small child, don't do that. And the child hears two commands. What do they hear? Don't and little kid goes, make up your mind. Which do you want, the don't or the do? I'm, I'm just learning this language thing here you got going on here. I'm a little confused. The don't do that thing's got me really going. I don't know which one. Don't jump on the, oh, jump on the bed. Yeah, I like that. That sounds good. I'll keep doing it. We should say what? Stay on your bottom. So always say what you want. So the brain takes words literally. Why am I teaching this? Because when you answer the phone, how am I help you? How, how, how am I? Well, if you don't know, how am I supposed to know? So we never answer the phone with, how may I help you? We always answer the phone with something very simple. I'm happy to help you. Sales department, this is Steve, this is Paul. I'm happy to help you. Everybody say, I'm happy to help you. Ready, go. I'm happy. To, one more time, go. I'm happy. So write this down on your homework page. Turn it over. Here's another item I want you to write down. Label phones. I'm happy to help you. You want to go back and put a label on all the phones in your store. Now when you do that, 
You have to put a line underneath, I'm happy to help you. So it looks like this. I'm happy to help you. I don't know if you can see this from the back. If it's going to be, I'm just writing it, I'm happy to help you. Now you have to do this underneath it. It's not a smiley face. It's called tone down, tone up. So as our last topic, as we start to wrap things up here, this is what we call an easy win. Now, if you sales to borrow Paul, I'm happy to help you. Well, you don't sound happy, which means you just lied to me, which is a great way to start a relationship with a lie. <laughs> so it's much better if you go tone down, tone up. Sales to Paul, I'm happy to help you. I'm happy to help you. Do it. Ready to go. I'm happy to help you. And that's tone down, tone up. Everybody get that? Otherwise, it doesn't work. Parts department, I'm happy to help you. <laughs> Yeah, you are. Have you been to Miami? Well, no, why does that have to do with it? The way they answer the phone is very friendly. Well, you know what? It can be anywhere. I just, I'm surprised. That is a training issue. Everybody follow what she just, just said? It's a training issue. Don't yell at me for something I've never been trained properly in. So that's us in this room. Selling cars on Tuesdays is the name of the program. We're, gonna, we're, we're, we're done. We've wrapped things up here. And I, I said earlier, if you come up and I'll scan your sheet for you, and then you can have free access to our online training. George, I gave everybody that came here today two things. Access to my online training because they stayed for the seminar and a book, my, free, my book for free. Now the book, my pleasure. And again, thank you for having me out to your convention. I love coming to your convention. And I look forward to any, any future things as well. So here's how we finish up today's program. You've got a lot more material in your booklet. Material that we couldn't cover today, but you've got an idea of what the reason for being here today was. Leadership is example. We are the people that make the difference. It's the speed and the intention of the owner and the manager that they follow. And when we make a mistake, do they blow that out of proportion? Yes or no? You show up late, then what does that send? What signal does that send? You don't care? Everybody else can be late. I've got a dealer principal down in Florida. He's in the gym at 4.15, five days a week doing full contact karate. Now, when he gets to the store at 7.30, is he ready for a day? No, I'm going to break my phone. Everybody follow me on this? But he is a guy that I helped go from 419 cars a month, his best month ever, used car department in a large new car franchise. And because of my influence and for him saying, yes, I'll lean down the hill and do something different, he did 731 cars in one month. But you know what he did? He went way lean, way down the hill. He involved the women's volleyball pro tournament on the lot. Net. He brought in sand and he made it a segment of their pro tour for women's volleyball in Florida for marketing. That's a guy that leans down the hill. So I got to get you out of your comfort zone. I've got to have you do something different. Think about training on a daily basis. I'm going to leave you with 10 words, two letters to each word. Now this is you talking. This is you talking. If it is to be, other people I've seen, other speakers will finish their training. If it is to be, it is up to me. Who's heard that before? Now a lot of you have. And what that is means that that's you talking. If it is to be, it's up to me. You're the people that, you're, you, that others follow. And you are the example. If it is to be, it is up to me. May we all strive to be the best we can be every day. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure being here. Thank you.